Welcome back to From the Lab episode two. I'm Daniel Shake. I'm an incoming PhD student at Portland State University. I'm also an avid meteorite classifier. I've been doing it for a few years now and I plan to continue doing this. And what better time than receiving more samples during the summer? In fact, this is the first summer that of which that I will be doing meteorite classification full time. This will be my full time income source for the next three to four months. And I definitely rely on more collectors to send me samples. So please send me samples. All right, so for this week's episode of the Tover Spin Meteorite Group, I thought, why not cover the first classification that Raymond Borges wanted to send to me? And this is a very interesting chondrite. And I think it's a good learning point for anyone who really wants to get to understand meteorite classification in general. So I kind of went last week from a very difficult chondrite group, the Ensotite chondrites, because this was an Ensotite melt. Uh, if you want to know more, go watch last week. But this week, we're going to be cover a more simple classification. This is an L5. And let's get started. So there's actually a video attached uh, to this video itself, which is a little interesting. But basically, look for these criteria. This sample has chondrules, metal grains, and clasts. And that is what you will see in this video here. Looking at the sample enhanced specimen, we can see a couple interesting things about it. This specimen has what's called a chondritic texture, uh, which basically implies that you can see a bunch of chondrules surrounded by matrix. You also have uh, iron nickel metal, and I believe there's sulfides in here like troilite that are dispersed throughout the sample. You can see there is preferential weathering of the iron nickel metal uh, over any of the other phases that is normal when you have terrestrial weathering going on. You have what appears to be some clasts in this sample, so potentially clasts or igneous clasts or just class of other chondritic material from other classes maybe. And we can also see that uh, some of these chondrules have appeared to have been in, or have, to have some interaction with the matrix, meaning that the sample probably was heated on its parent asteroid. So that, of course, is all important to look for when you're doing geochemical analyses. Now, I also have a thin section right here of the same sample. And I'll be showing a few pictures of the thin section in a bit, but as you can see here, you can also see chondral outlines and you can also see the matrix and you can see where these metal grain areas are. So that's just some of the physical characteristics I noted when I looked at the sample initially. Now let's get to the really cool part. Let's look at the petrography. So this is looking at XPL images of the sample. So cross polarized light images of the thin section piece that I just showed. And you can see, if we look through all the images, uh, this is what we call a typical chondritic texture, which basically means that you have the chondrules. So we can see, it's a little hard to tell, but these, this is a Bartolomine chondral. This is a radiopyrexine chondral. Uh, we can see this is also a chondral outline. This is another chondral outline. This is a porphyritic uh, olivine, maybe porphyritic olivine pyroxene texture. And then a couple other chondrules. And you can see they're all present or set in this fine grain matrix. And you have some opaque phases, that's iron nickel metal, uh, like chemocytes, you have troilite in there, you also have some, some chromite. And something else of interest to note is that you have this secondary recrystallized, if we can find it here, somewhere here, this secondary recrystallized albitic plagioclase phase that's present, it's about 15 microns in size on average. And the chondrules in general, the chondrules in general are about 700-ish microns in size, but there's a large range in their sizes. Some are 200, some are 1,000 uh, microns, or about one millimeter. So it really varies. And something else of interest to note is that when you talk about chondrites, right? So chondrites come from asteroids, or what we could basically call chondrites as primitive meteorites derived from asteroids that haven't experienced extensive melting aka differentiation. But even on these parent bodies, uh, chondrites have been altered via secondary processes like thermal metamorphism, which is just heating on the parent asteroid due to either the internal heating from the decay of radionuclides that are extinct, like aluminum-26 and iron-50, or, or impacting 
onto the parent asteroid causing uh, shock-induced heating followed by thermal annealing and heating of the sample, which is also metamorphism. And what you end up getting is you end up getting these equilibrated like textures, which means that the sample has been heated. You have diffusion of, of some elements within uh, the, the minerals themselves. And you also get what's called chondral matrix integration, which means that the chondrules themselves, their textures become blurred. And so you tend to see a coarsening of the matrix, a coarsening of the metal and sulfides, and a more blurring of the chondrules. So everything tends to be more of what, what, what is rather just one singular phase, if it looks in texture, as opposed to seeing a definitive chondral matrix split. And that's sort of what's going on here. You can see that you can roughly see this chondral outline and probably the same with this, but you can see the matrix itself is coarsening and it's really hard to tell what's chondral and what's matrix here. Now you can see it a little better with the non-porphyritic chondrules. So the Bart olivine and the radiopyrexine chondrules, you can see that better. Uh, that, that is normally a common occurrence that's been found that for some reason, the porphyritic chondrules uh, are much harder to distinguish. And so you tend to see the Bart olivine and the radiopyrexine chondrules much better as you go to the higher uh, petrologic types five and six. So that's the petrography. Uh, so we've established that this point looks to be an equilibrated chondrite, but we don't know what group it is. And it looks to be an ordinary chondrite for the most part because we don't see calcium lumen rich inclusions. We can see other phases present besides enstatite. And we can see metal sulfides, chondral matrix, the chondral sizes are relatively consistent with that of ordinary chondrites. So what kind of ordinary chondrite do we have? Well, before we get to that, and we look at the chemistry, let's look at magnetic susceptibility. So I'm very fortunate enough to own a magnetic susceptibility meter, which is very nice because you can get magnetic susceptibility values from samples, or at least an estimate of what it should be, and then see whether or not it matches up with everything else. So I just did a quick scan of the sample. What you do is you just take your, uh, I can just, I can just show it right here. If that makes it easier. But so what I did was, so I took the magnetic susceptibility meter. I call this the pumpkin because it's orange, and I hold it up against the sample. And then you click it, and then you wait for it. You have to do an air measurement, which means you measure an air background without the sample, and then you measure the sample with it, and then you get your reading, and then you normalize it according to what the mass of the sample is. So in this case, about 20 grams. So not only do I get magnetic susceptibility, which is reported as a log X, but I also get electrical conductivity. So that's something useful that this instrument can do that you don't find in stuff like the SM30, which is also more expensive. And this plot's right about here. So it fits within the L group in terms of magnetic susceptibility. But of course, that isn't the most reliable thing to use. Uh, the most reliable way to tell what kind of meteorite group you have is through geochemistry. And this is looking at the individual chemistry of the minerals, olivine and pyroxene within the sample. So this sample is equilibrated. What that means is that the values of the olivine and pyroxene grains, or low calcium pyroxene in this case, are very similar. So if you look at all the olivine grains, they have roughly the same uh, iron over iron plus magnesium ratios. We call this phthalate number. And the, the low calcium pyroxene grains have a similar uh, ferrocellite and elastinite contents, which is just for ferrocellite, the iron over iron plus iron, calcium, magnesium. And then for elastinite, it's just calcium over the other three. What this means is that as the sample is being heated on its parent asteroid, you have interdiffusion of iron and magnesium across a lot, all the different olivine and low calcium pyroxene grains, and you tend to get an equilibrated value. This is generally how thermodynamics works when you involve high temperature processes via secondary heating. And so through tons of research, it's been found that you can split up uh, you know, the HLs and LLs that are equilibrated by their phthalate and ferrocellate values on this chart. Now, of course, there is more of a continuity between Ls and LLs, there's a slight intermediate area. And then even with Hs and Ls, there are some samples that fall in between. But for the most part, you get a pretty good sense as to what group it falls in. And this is generally consistent with oxygen isotopes and magnetic susceptibility and chondral size and other factors. But for this sample, this sample has 
a phthalate value of about 22, 23, and a phosphate value of about 20. So this plot's right about here. And this plot's pretty much within the L group. So it matches up pretty nicely with the magnetic susceptibility of earlier. So my final conclusions on this sample are that, is that this is an ordinary chondrite in L5. And it's an L5 due to its petrography, its magnetic susceptibility, the equilibrated values of olivine and low calcium pyroxene grains, and the average size of the secondary recrystallized plagioclase, plagioclase grains. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but the reason why plagioclase is important is because it's been noted that when you have thermal metamorphism going on, glass within the chondrules uh, devitrifies, which means that it crystallizes. And in this phase, you actually form these microlites or these small grains of plagioclase, which is generally albitic or sodium rich in composition. And then these grains get larger and larger as you go to higher uh, temperature or higher grade uh, metamorphism. So type sixes in general have been heated to higher temperatures than type fives, which have been heated to higher temperatures than type fours. And so plagioclase, there's a range in its grain size that's been noted that marks type sixes from type fives from type fours. So if you want to know more about all this that I'm mentioning, I highly advise you to read this very interesting paper. It is a little dated, but it is nice. And this is Ben Schmusen Wood, 1967, Chemical Petrologic Classification for Chondritic Meteorites in GCA. So if you'd like your sample to be featured, or if you'd like to send me more samples to classify, please do. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this is my only source of income for the next few months. And since I'll be moving to Portland soon to pursue my PhD at Portland State University, any amounts of support would help. So uh, my rates have increased from earlier since uh, this is my only income. And of course that I'm receiving much more interest. So the rates are 350 per sample. There's no longer an hourly fee associated with uh, analysis time or a specific amount based on a thin section return time. This is just the standard set fee for any sample. So if you have a chondrite or a lunar, it's gonna be the same price. If additional factors need to be made, such as oxygen isotopes or trace element work, that is going to be in addition to this price. This price is just covering the typical uh, microprobe slash SEM work, plus uh, the petrography and covering the cost of making a thin section. So if you'd like to contact me, you can contact me through Facebook or you can contact, it, contact me at my email right here. Thanks again and hope that everyone has a good time on the weekly meteorite hangout by Topher Spin. Thanks. <laughs>